It's been a long time since I've been excited about an Intel product launch. Like, a long time. After many years of their 14 nanometer plus 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 architecture, we're finally getting something new. With the introduction of their 12th generation desktop line, or Alder Lake, they brought a really cool feature that we've only seen in ARM-based devices. They basically integrated a big little system for their cores. What that means is for the first time ever in a desktop processor, you're getting main performance cores combined with smaller efficiency cores. Whether you think that's necessary or not in the desktop market, that's up for debate. But what isn't up for debate is that it's innovative. Now with Intel finally being innovative, I just had to get my hands on one. And this is the Intel i5-12600K. It's an i5, so it's obviously their budget lineup, but it's still a solid performer. So what I wanted to do was take this and compare it to a Ryzen 7 5700G, which I've used plenty of times on this channel. Now you're probably asking, why are you comparing this processor to a 5700G? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, they're roughly the same price. Two, they have the same thread count. Three, they both have integrated graphics. And four, everybody and their mom has done a video on the 12600K versus a Ryzen either 5600X or 5700X or even 5800X. So let's mix things up a bit. So I put both of those processors through their paces. I have the results and they're pretty impressive. So stick around and uh, we'll talk about it. First things first, let's compare the specs on these processors. For the 12600K, you're getting 10 cores. Now it's a little different with their big little system. So you're actually getting six performance cores and four efficiency cores. So the performance cores are hyper-threaded. So you essentially get a six core, 12 threaded chip with an additional four threads of efficiency cores. Doing the math, that adds up to 16 threads. Now the performance cores have a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz and can boost up to 4.9, while the efficiency cores have a base clock of 2.8 gigahertz and can boost up to 3.7. On the other side, we have the 5700G, which is a traditional eight core, 16 thread processor with a base clock of 3.8 and a boost clock to 4.6. Both these processors come in at roughly the same price. The 12600K is about $300 retail while the 5700G is sitting in about $330 right now. I think I saw it at Micro Center for exactly 300. So depending on where you look and what time of the year it is, prices can vary, but roughly the same price. Now I'm briefly gonna touch on TDP because it's listed on the specs and you kind of have to talk about it. Although I don't think it's a really good measure for what the actual power output is, but Intel lists the 12600K as a TDP of 125 to 150 watts, while the 5700G has a rated TDP of 65 watts. Now, let's wait until real world tests to see what the actual power draw of these chips are, but that's what they have listed. Now features, uh, the 12600K is obviously newer, so you're getting DDR4 RAM as well as the option to use DDR5, and you get PCI Gen 5.0. Meanwhile, with the 5700G, you're limited to just DDR4 RAM and PCI Gen 3.0. Now, a lot of things don't even make full use of PCI Gen 4.0, so it's not like PCI Gen 3 is even a bad thing, but if you're looking for something completely future-proof, obviously the 12600K is the way to go. So those are general specs. Let's start talking about benchmarking and performance. Now, I've broken this up into two kind of categories. One where we are using a dedicated GPU for the tests, just to see how it performs in gaming and productivity with a dedicated GPU. And then once again, with only the integrated graphics. Now for the GPU section of this, we're gonna be using an RTX 2080, which might be a little too powerful for these kind of budget chips, but I think it's fine. And before we jump into the GPU tests, let's just run Cinebench to get that out of the way. In Cinebench R23, the 12600K came in with a multi-core score of 17470 and a single core result of 1870. On the flip side of that, the 5700G gave us a multi-core score of 13763 and a single core score of 1413. 
So right off the bat in raw power, you can see that the 12600K does have a leg up on the 5700G. But as everybody knows, that's not the whole story. Let's jump into some real tests. For the following tests, we had our processors combined with the RTX 2080, and the first test we ran was 3 dmarks Time Spy. The 12600 gave us an overall score of 11,046, with a graphics score of 10,718, and a compute score of 13,370. Moving over to the 5700G, not as good. We got an overall score of 10,726, a graphics score of 10,718, and a compute score of 10,722. Those are strangely consistent numbers. So what that's telling us right off the bat is that if you're gonna take these processors and combine them with a dedicated graphics card, you should get better performance on the 12600K. So let's run some games and see if that holds true. We ran CSGO at 1080p high settings and with the RTX 2080 on the 12600K, we got an average FPS of 315. That's obviously extremely playable and ready for your super holy crap high refresh rate monitors. And the 5700G was no slump either, coming in with an average FPS of 226. Let's move on to The Witcher 3, where we ran it at 1080p with ultra settings, so pretty much maxed out at 1080p. The trend continues where the 12600K outperforms the 5700G, with the 12600K giving us an average FPS of 97. Falling behind that is the 5700G with an average FPS of 64. So with AAA titles like that, personally, I think 60 FPS is the sweet spot. If you can average over 60 FPS in a AAA title, then I think you're set. Anything higher than that is pushing into the territory where you'd wanna step up your resolution of your monitor or go with a high refresh rate monitor. But a majority of people are still rocking 1080p 60 fps monitor so again this is perfectly fine one more time let's test another game we went with borderlands 3 and just like the witcher we are seeing the 12600k come in with a higher fps sitting at about 92 fps and the 5700g coming in behind it again with an average fps of 71. so our time spy scores didn't lie if you're going to combine these processors with a dedicated graphics card the 12600k is going to give you better performance across the board However, that's not the whole story. In this day and age, everybody knows how miserable it is to try to get a GPU. It's like my dad used to always say, if you find a GPU at retail, then you, you gotta buy it, even if the retail price isn't actually retail. Crazy world we live in. So one of the main reasons that I said before why I wanted to compare the 12600K to the 5700G is that they both have integrated graphics. So let's see how these chips fare when we take away that dedicated graphics card and leave it up to the integrated graphics to give us our performance. Now let's run through those same tests again. In Time Spy for the 12600K, we've got obviously a much lower score overall at 888 with a graphics score of 764 and a compute score of 12,084. So yeah, obviously much worse. Now let's take a look at the 5700G and uh-oh, here comes the 5700G's first victory of the day, giving us an overall score of 1,693 with a graphics score of 1,480 and a compute score of 9,337. Now according to these results, that technically means that the 5700G will now perform better than the 12600K without the help of that dedicated graphics card. So let's move on to the games and see if that's actually true. So in CSGO, we lowered the resolution to 720p and set the graphics to medium, and the 12600K on integrated graphics gave us an average FPS of 51. Moving over to the 5700G, things got much better with an average FPS of 108. That's more than double. But will that trend continue when we move on to some more demanding games? Let's try The Witcher 3. Now, again, we lowered the resolution to 720p and set the graphics quality to low, and on the 12600K, we got an average FPS of 29. 29 FPS on 720p lowest settings. That is getting into the territory where I wouldn't really consider it even playable. But let's try the 5700G. At the same settings, we got a much more playable 45 FPS. Now I know it's not 60, but it's still within that territory, I'd say. If you're still above 30, then I would consider it playable. 45 is, Obviously not gonna be the smoothest experience, but certainly playable. 
Onto our final game, Borderlands 3, again, lowering the resolution to 720p and setting the graphics quality to low. The 12600K comes in with an average FPS of 22, so even worse than The Witcher. And you can certainly feel the tearing and stuttering at 22 FPS. Now, surprisingly, when we moved to the 5700G, we got an even better FPS than on The Witcher, coming in at 54 FPS, almost pushing that 60 FPS kind of threshold. And that's honestly extremely impressive for a processor's integrated graphics. So gaming, it's pretty cut and dry. If you have a dedicated graphics card and you wanna upgrade your processor, the 2600K is certainly the better buy. However, if you're looking for something cheaper and more budget oriented, you wanna play maybe less graphically intense games, or you just wanna wait for graphics cards to come down in price, the 5700G can certainly tie you over until then. But I did wanna run another test. For all you editors and creators out there, I personally use Premiere Pro, so I figured let's try these processors by themselves rendering a project in Premiere Pro. So I took some drone footage from my soccer games that I play on the weekend or football for all you non-Americans. And I took a four minute and 48 second chunk of that and rendered it out to see how long it would take for each of these chips to render that section. So using software encoding on that section in H.265, the 12600K rendered it out in four minutes and 55 seconds. So nearly real time. Switching over to the 5700G and it was a little bit slower at seven minutes and 22 seconds. So, so I'd say if you're a creator, obviously working in Premiere Pro, then you're gonna wanna go with the 12600K. Now with these tests, we've discovered that the 12600K is an overall more powerful processor while the 5700G has the advantage when it comes to graphics. But what about power usage? I mentioned earlier that the TDPs for the chips were wildly different and that the 5700G should be much more efficient with pretty much half the rated TDP, but what do our tests show us? Now check the power usage of each chips at idle, when gaming, and when hit with a max load. At idle, the 12600K comes in at 15 watts while the 5700G sits at 19. When gaming, the 12600K pulls 31 watts while the 5700G hits 52. Now at full load, the 12600K is pulling 120 watts, whereas the 5700G is only pulling around 80. Now, this is with just standard manufacturer overclocking, precision boost overdrive to the 5700G and basic Intel XMP, whatever they call their auto tuning on their chip set. Now we're seeing a kind of weird trend here where the 12600K is more power efficient at idle as well as gaming, but you're getting worse performance in gaming. So that kind of makes sense. But at max load, Intel wasn't lying on their TDP. This thing is pulling 120 Watts. And again, it's, more powerful, so that kind of makes sense. So I guess when you think about it, it's really not that interesting. I thought it was interesting. What does all this mean? Overall, which is the better processor? Well, like 99% of the time, it completely depends on your use case. Are you looking to build a tiny ITX system with no dedicated graphics? Then go with the 5700G. Are you looking for a budget chip to pair with a budget graphics card? Then go with the 12600K. Are you building an ITX system, but wanting to upgrade or add a GPU later? Then go with the 12600K. Are you looking for the most power efficient chip? Then go with the, well, I guess that's a little more difficult. Anyway, overall, I think this is a fantastic processor, especially for the price. Anybody building a brand new PC right now, I would mostly recommend them to go with this 12600K. It's extremely powerful for less than $300 and it has all the futuristic kind of future-proof features that you need with DDR5 and PCI Gen 5.0. So I think Intel finally knocked it out of the park here and it's good to see competition. Back when AMD was the underdog, I was always cheering for them. And now that AMD is on top, I've kind of been cheering for Intel. So good to see them be competitive again. And as you know, when manufacturers compete, it drives down prices and the consumer wins. But that's all I have for you today. Let me know down in the comments if you've already bought a 12th gen Elder Lake processor or if you're thinking about buying one yourself, what are you gonna do with it? Or are you gonna go with the AMD 5700G in your build? Let me know down in the comments, but that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, drop a like. If you're interested in content like this, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next one.